All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Erin Tulia, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, um, I started a group on Facebook called Saving Our Pandas. Uh, it's the group, not the page. So if anybody's interested, if you're not already a member of that group, we talk all about natural treatments. Um, so you can go to Saving Our Pandas on Facebook. Um, that group has about 3,500 members at this point. So um, I'd love to see you all there. Um, so my name is Erin Tullius. I'm a lay homeopath. I practice out of Central Texas. Um, and uh, I got into this uh, because of my own child um, and his uh, diagnosis of pandas, which we later found out was uh, pans um, uh, with uh, Lyme disease. Um, so a lot of people ask me, the very first question I get when I say that I'm a homeopath, they say, well, okay, what the heck is homeopathy? So. Is, is anybody out here familiar with homeopathy? Have you utilized homeopathy? Do you think maybe you've utilized homeopathy? Because a lot of people are in that boat too. <laughs> okay, so um, a mixed bag. Okay, so what the heck is homeopathy? I'm just gonna kind of give you a little um, rundown. So a lot of people think when I say homeopathy that this is homeopathy, right? Supplements, things like that, anything um, naturally minded, right? Um, or they think that this is homeopathy. So uh, things like essential oils, right? Is that homeopathy? Um, or they think herbs, it must be herbal medicine, right? They think that that must be homeopathy. But actually, uh, homeopathy is its own distinct system of medicine, uh, and a lot of people don't realize that. So. Uh, I'm just going to kind of give you a little bit of a rundown, a little history lesson on what exactly homeopathy is um, so that you can help uh, educate others as well. Um, so homeopathy was developed by Samuel Hahnemann in the early 1800s. Uh, Samuel Hahnemann was a medical doctor. Um, he uh, was very avant-garde for his time. He uh, did lots of very uh, kind of unusual things. He was very um, interested in alternative treatments. He did something with uh, cinchona bark. Cinchona bark um, was known at the time for treating malaria. And he decided that he was going to try to um, help uh, some of his malaria patients. So he utilized the cinchona bark and he decided that uh, he was gonna ingest it for a lengthy period of time. And something very interesting happened. He wound up developing the symptoms of malaria. So he hypothesized that if he was developing the symptoms of malaria by taking the cure for malaria, that um, perhaps he could utilize that um, cinchona bark in smaller doses in order to then um, cure his malaria patients. So he started, um, doing what's called uh, the process of succussion. So he would take those, um, uh, the uh, original material of the cinchona bark, he would shake it up in a shaker, dump it out, and then pour more water in. Eventually, he would get to the point where he had what's called an immaterial dose. Basically, there was nothing left of the original material or the cinchona bark. However, he was still curing his patients at that point, and that was what we call the first homeopathic proving. Um, so uh, today we utilize um, these um, sugar pellets, as you can see on the screen. Those tiny little sugar pellets are impregnated with different um, materials that then um, we utilize to, uh, uh, you know, help cure or um, bring about a, a healing for the patient to try to bring them back to healing. Um, it's based on the principle of like treats like. So. Um, I, as you know, a, a lot of us are not um, big fans of vaccines, but I, I think sometimes that's an easy way to explain how it, uh, homeopathy works. So we are um, putting something in the body that elicits a very, very tiny immune response that then the, um, the body is able to heal that particular issue. Um, all right, so uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, many of the early US hospitals were actually homeopathic hospitals. Uh, many of the doctors, uh, medical doctors that were practicing in the United States uh, were practicing homeopathy, um, either alongside allopathic medicine or exclusively. Um, and then it wasn't until uh, 
Well, homeopathy um, has actually been very successful in pandemics as well. So uh, just uh, one example is with the Spanish flu. Uh, those homeopathic hospitals that I spoke about had about a 98% um, success rate, whereas uh, in um, allopathy, they only had about a 72% success rate. So people that were being treated with homeopathy were actually far more successful in their outcomes. Um, but it was actually nearly wiped out uh, with the um, three-letter organizations, the AMA, the FDA, all of these organizations that came in. Um, they then uh, decided that they uh, couldn't make a, a good financial living out of homeopathy because people were healing after only one or two doses. Um, so they decided that it would be better to go with pharmaceutical medications and they decided that they were going to systematically wipe out homeopaths within the U.S. They actually did the same thing to chiropractors. There's a whole history on it. It's pr pretty fascinating if you're ever interested in learning more about that. Um, but I uh, the other thing is that homeopathy has been and is utilized worldwide. So um, many of my colleagues actually uh, are from India. Um, there's many in Australia. There's many all over the world. Um, in the UK, the royal family, um, you know, they talk quite a bit about utilizing homeopathy um, and homeopathic treatment. So again, this is homeopathy. This is a separate system of medicine. Homeopathy isn't just a blanket term for um, anything natural. So um, most of you, I, I believe, are here to help your children. So how can homeopathy help your child? So I think of myself as a detective. Um, when you bring your case to me, I'm speaking to you. I'm um, asking you questions that might seem a little bit strange. Um, and maybe unusual. So I take a little bit of a different approach than many of the other um, practitioners that you're going to see. Because um, I'm not looking just at symptoms. So I'm taking a case history based on everything, including in utero, including past family traumas, including um, things like exterior stresses, like, you know, if you grew up in. Uh, you know, Fallujah where there was bombings or something like that, it would be a very, very different um, type of stress that would happen um, in your life versus, you know, somebody who grew up on a lovely donkey dairy <laughs> or something. <laughs> you know, so very, very different stressors, um, exterior stressors. So I'm asking those kinds of questions. And then I'm asking about what makes your child unique? What is it that um, your child does differently than maybe other children? What is it that you know your child is extremely interested in? Sometimes they're, you know, in, intensely interested in dinosaurs, for example, and they, they've been that way since they were a kid, and they can name all the dinosaurs, and they know everything about every single dinosaur. So that's the kind of information that's interesting to me, because there's a couple hundred thousand different remedies, and it's very difficult to narrow it down. When I start to understand a little bit more about who your child is and who they are at their core, those types of things um, can be very helpful in determining uh, the right homeopathic medicine for your child. Um, so I'm, again, much more interested in who your child is rather than uh, their symptoms or their diagnosis. That information is helpful. Test results are helpful, um, you know, but it's, it's not necessary for me to make a determination. So uh, the other question people ask me is, why homeopathy? And this is a story that I love to tell. So um, this is my son, Tyler. He was uh, about four in that picture. Um, this was pre-Panda's uh, diagnosis. Um, he was a very loving, um, sweet child. He was a little bit intense, but um, he was a boy, so, you know, climbing to the top of the play structure and those kinds of things. Um, and But he was also the kid that, you know, when we went for a walk, he would pick me a flower every time and, you know, bring me a flower. Just very, very sweet, kind um, child. And this is my son after his diagnosis. So um, I, I don't know about you, but I can see it in his eyes. Um, he became a shell of a human being. Um, it was very difficult. He raged about uh, 20 hours a day. 
um, 20 hours a day out of you know, 24 because the only time he slept was about four hours a night and that was it. Um, and, or he uh, would be catatonic. He would sit on the couch. Um, I would set him in front of the television because I didn't know what else to do, researching, trying to figure out how to help him. Um, and at one point uh, in that top picture, um, he decided that he was gonna live in a cardboard box in my living room. So he became so afraid of the outside world that he didn't even want to exit the cardboard box in the living room. Um, and uh, that went on for uh, at least a year and a half before we found a diagnosis. Um, but the diagnosis was just the beginning, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, after his diagnosis, uh, even though that was helpful, um, we still didn't know where to turn. Um, there were the pediatrician we went to, who was wonderful and holistic and all of those things, uh, said, well, I think you should move to the country. Or, <laughs> you know, I mean, he gave us like very broad spectrum advice. I'm like, okay, but what do I do now? Like he's raging 20 hours a day um, and I, I can't even get him to, you know, eat beyond, um, a bean burrito that I could get him at the local taco shop. And just so y'all are aware, like I was the crunchy mom, you know, so like for me to go get a bean burrito for my kid every day was like unheard of. So, um, but you do what you have to do in those situations. Um, so uh, we utilized, this is my son today. Uh, he's 14 years old. Um, he's about 85 to 90% healed. Uh, he does still have some physical uh, issues. Um, mainly, uh, he's developed a pectus excavatum, which is a collapsed sternum, um, and a number of other things. But uh, for the most part, if he was walking down the street, if you met him, you would never know uh, that th he had ever been sick. Um, so I, how do we get there? So the, the very first time um, when he was in that uh, cardboard box, I saw a homeopath. Uh, and a homeopath um, in the UK, he prescribed a, a homeopathic medicine. I gave it to my son, and within hours, he left the cardboard box. Um, and to me, as a mom, that was the most powerful testimony that homeopathy could truly heal my child. And uh, I knew from that point on that we needed to utilize homeopathy, even if we were doing other treatments alongside of that. So. I, you know, stuck with homeopathy, and I, I eventually decided I needed to learn as much as I possibly could because I wanted to help other kids going through the same situation, um, especially as, as I was, you know, consulting with Sandra and all these other moms. I was like, you know, I could do this. I could help all these other kids because it just broke my heart every time I got new people into my group, it, you know, great, I have 3,500 members, but really that's not so great <laughs> because all of those parents are suffering. So um, so uh, here's another story. So this is a, a client of mine, this is Nadine. Um, her two boys are uh, twins, um, severely autistic, uh, nonverbal. Um, and Nadine was very skeptical of homeopathy. Um, initially, uh, and she told me so. And so she uh, registered, I said, you know, I think you might wanna register for this class I'm teaching. I'm just gonna talk about homeopathy. You can learn a little bit about it if you want, and then, you know, we can, you know, go from there. So after the first class, Nadine scheduled um, her first boy, and, uh, and I've been treating them ever since. Um, so I, a couple of the things, she wrote me a really long testimonial that I'm not gonna read the entire thing to you, but um, she said, I was really amazed how quickly we saw changes. Uh, now her first boy um, was uh, raging at school, having a very difficult time. He had one-on-one -on -one, um, aids, and um, they were about to kick him out of school. And not only that, but he also had very, um, a very difficult time because he had been abused in his previous school um, and uh, that ended up coming to a head and is now a criminal case. So um, very severely um, uh, abused and, and uh, lots of things that he wasn't able to communicate. Um, 
and so I, you know, I think the, the beauty of homeopathy is that I was able to connect with her son and understand who he is and why he is the way he is. And the fact that, you know, he's dealing with something um, that most kids don't ever have to deal with, but not only that, he can't communicate it. So it was really special to be able to, to connect with, um, with both these boys. Um, they were both on a huge cocktail of prescription medications when I met them. Um, they've now weaned almost completely off. But I think they take like, um, each of them take a, a very small dose of uh, um, uh, something to help them sleep. But other than that, um, they're almost off all of their medications. They've been weaning off um, at the direction of their doctor. So um, it's been really interesting kind of working with these boys alongside their um, medical doctor who uh, um, doesn't believe in homeopathy. Um, so that's been a, a pretty amazing journey as well. Um, and she, she also said that she feels that they're totally different boys. Um, they have more hope. The whole family dynamic is much better. Um, and you can see it. Um, all of them are much happier, um, much healthier. And, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to, to see who they actually are. They're communicating more. Um, they're doing better in school. Um, they're not raging. Uh, all of these things happened um, only with homeopathy. And not only that, but we were weaning them off their regular medications as well. So um, I, I like to say when we start to wean kids off medications, it's almost like homeopathy did double duty, right? Because not only did we uh, start to heal that child, but as the medications went away, they didn't need them anymore. Um, so those kinds of things were pretty amazing to see, even for myself. So I think, you know, um, as practitioners, sometimes you, you tend to get a little bit jaded, but um, for me, I think because I have a personal connection, a personal story, it's been so amazing for me to watch these kids go from, you know, raging and sad and depressed and, um, you know, anxious and all of these things to, you know, help healthy and thriving uh, children. Um, so I wanted to just open it up to a couple of questions. I don't know if that's Okay, but <laughs> um, if anybody has any questions about homeopathy, um, about specific diagnoses, about uh, anything that I do personally, um, I am in Central Texas, but I, again, as I said, everything is, is via Zoom, so uh, I can see you wherever you are. Um, and I found actually that that's a little bit more helpful for PANDAS parents in particular or autism parents just because sometimes it's tough to get to an appointment. Um, I do have a, a QR code. I know Sandra's going to slap me on the hand here, but. Uh, <laughs> I have a question for you. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, okay, so um, on the QR code, if you have a smartphone, you can scan it um, and that will take you to. Uh, I wanted to kind of give back a little bit. I'm, I'm going to give out a, um, a free homeopathy starter kit um, to to somebody, a lucky winner. So um, if anybody wants to pull that out, you're welcome to scan that, and I'm going to answer Sandra's question. Is it this one? Oh. Yeah, so um, I practice more intuitively. Um, there are many homeopaths utilizing what's called classical homeopathy. So classical homeopathy is this idea that we utilize one remedy, um, and that one remedy is that that person's constitutional. It's the closest to um, that particular child. Um, and uh, while I do think constitutional prescribing is helpful, I have found that, especially with these very complex cases, uh, it's not always enough. Um, so, you know, I, I know that with my own child, I utilize many different remedies. Um, including things like nozodes. Um, those are homeopathic uh, medicines that are made from um, disease. So, you know, um, from smallpox or, you know, whatever it is, um, or tuberculosis, those types of things. Uh, I started utilizing those um, with my own son and we started seeing more progress. Um, so while I think constitutional prescribing is great for kids that maybe have a very mild case of pandas or something like that. Um, I haven't found it to be as effective for kids who are more affected, um, if that makes sense. Does that answer? Yeah. 
Anybody else have any questions? I'm happy to just chat with anybody. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I have uh, access to different homeopathic remedies um, for uh, COVID, um, people that contract COVID. Um, I, I, you know, there's a whole protocol, we call it the similimum, which is basically um, lots of homeopaths get together. They all talk about the, um, the remedies that they are seeing um, working for their particular patients. So I've got about 12 of those different remedies um, that we're utilizing. I also, um, I have done, um, unfortunately, um, for a few who've been forced vaccinated um, in order to keep their jobs, uh, I've done detox protocols for them. Um, I have done um, shedding protocols and lots of different things as well for the vaccine. Um, and, uh, and then I do acute care for people who uh, have COVID or who are still experiencing symptoms from COVID. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I do, I have several remedies that I've taken prophylactically, um, including the nosode from COVID, um, which I do have access to that. Uh, so that um, is kind of, um, you know, on the down low, we don't really <laughs> talk much about, <laughs> about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, there are specific uh, remedies that you can utilize um, prophylactically to assist um, just in case you are exposed. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a little bit about all the research and the things that you have done. Sure. Yeah, so um, in homeopathy, we have lots of different potencies. Um, the lower potencies, um, say like a 6C or a 9C, all the way up to a 200C, those you would find in your local supermarket, actually, um, like a natural grocers or places like that. Um, and uh, those uh, uh, homeopathic remedies are actually designed more to treat um, more of the physical symptoms. So uh, when we talk about um, utilizing the lower potency remedies, we're mainly talking about um, addressing more physical um, symptoms or acute care. Um, I prescribe remedies all the way up to mega potencies 10 mm. Um, and those potencies are more for trauma release and uh, things of that nature. So um, I like to utilize a variety of potencies uh, in my treatment. Some of it has to do with the trauma, um, perhaps taken on by the child um, and uh, or passed down from the parents. Um, and those would be in the higher potencies all the way down to a low potency, say a 6C or something like that on a daily basis for say some gut issues or something. So yeah, so I utilize all the different potencies that are available. So, yeah. Anybody else have questions? <laughs> no? All right, well thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. I'll be in tent six. Um, I know my schedule was filling up, but if you'd like to, um, I'd love to talk to y'all. <laughs>